collecting art in the 19th century was a popular occupation available to everyone, the aristocracy, bourgeoisie, industrial elites, artists, the military, and the intelligentsia alike would engage in collecting works of art. These groups of collectors were equally interested in ancient art of masters painting, graphics, and old craftsmanship. In other words, a collection of an industrialist, aristocrat, or artist would not be distinguishable in terms of its contents. This change at the turn of the 19th and 20th century with the emergence of new art movements such as Impressionism, Post-Impressionism and Avant-Garde, first of all of, uh, of French artists, initially considered controversial or scandalous. Uh, contemporary art occupied an important position in the preferences and interests of collectors at that time and it is the interest in contemporary art that shows the most significant differences between aristocrats and the bourgeoisie or other groups of collectors. Of course, in each studied case, one should consider individual preferences of the collector, his or her environment, education, and various external circumstances. However, in this presentation, I'm going to make some generalizations, analyzing, analyzing the collections of European aristocrats and statement they made. This approach is motivated by the fact that despite their nationality, members of the aristocracy shared the same beliefs and ideas. European aristocrats adhered to similar principles, had similar lifestyle and pastimes, and were connected by kinship or marriage and uh, ideals of supranational scope. Even if they differed according to fortune, uh, access to power or connections, the relative uniformity of the social group makes it possible to formulate general conclusions with regard to art collecting. Of course, as always, there are exceptions of the rule. We can identify aristocrats interested in the new direction in art at the time, such as uh, Count Harry Kessler, but generally speaking, members of aristocracy are not to be found among collectors interested in new arist artistic currents, new movements, new trends before 1918. Why is it so? The answer lies in the attitude of aristocrats toward the past and present in their need to emphasize continuity in art, and also in the general perception of impressionism, post-impressionism, and avant-garde before the First World War. What aristocrats sought in contemporary art were first and foremost its historical roots. Consequently, they purchased those works that, according to the critics of the time, could be placed on the timeline of art development. Accordingly, they avoided artists and artworks that at the turn uh, of the 19th and 20th century, uh, in this particular moment, represented art without history. The attitudes of aristocrats towards contemporary art were shaped by their worldview. They believed that the past was the value on which the present was founded. The rights and responsibilities found in the past were seen as the basis for the functioning of society. This belief, stemming from the ideology of 19th century conservatism, relate on two key notions, history and tradition. The conservative view of aristocrats assumed that respect for the past guarantees the continuity and the durability of future existence. Their understanding of history was closely related to the values they cherished. These values, as listed by Alice Watson, were name, ancestry, cult, glorification of family, memory, honor, and a strong sense of group and patriotism, at first understood as loyalty and obedience to the king, then with the ongoing political reforms and democratization, as serving the country. These assumptions were also reflected in aristocratic collecting. An example of aristocrat 
and collector deeply interested in contemporary art was Polish Count Edward Alexander Raczyński from Rogalin near Poznań. The bulk of his collection consisted of 279 works by artists representing Polish realism and symbolism and paintings by European artists, mainly French, uh, 124 works, German 22, and several examples of Belgian, Italian, Swiss, Spanish, Norwegian, and Dutch art. The works of European artists were purchased by Raczynski during his annual visits to Paris, a special place where new trends were born in a special historical moment when collection of works representing the new art movements were created by French, American, Russian, and German collectors. The majority of Raczynski's paintings were bought in the years 1892, uh, 1914. At the time when the significant collection of new French painting emerged in Paris. In his choices, the Polish count focused on three significant artistic phenomena present in Paris at the end of the century. The exhibitions of the Société Nationale de Beaux-Arts, a group known as La Bonne Noire, and uh, the Société Nouvelle Association. Generally speaking, he was interested in art which attracted the interest of official uh, entities, uh, the organi organizers of the Paris World Exhibition held in 1900, officials of the state cultural administration, and above all, Léonce Benedict, director of the Parisian Museum of Living Artists, the Luxembourg Museum. It was an art based on the paintings of previous generations. It was considered to continue the transformations that had been occurring in French painting for a hundred years, which with its root traced in the mid 19th century. In 1898, Benedict gave the name La Bonte Noire to a group of several artists who differed considerably in style, like Charles Cotel, Lucien Simon, Edouard Ramonjon, René Menach, René Prinet. Uh, other commentators wrote that uh, while La Bonte Noire was influenced by Impressionism, it is also stood in opposition to it. One art historian later described La Bonte Noire as the avant-garde uh, of traditional art, l'avant-garde de la traditionnelle. In 1900, the artist belonging to La Bonte Noire founded Société Nouvelle, creating space for joint exhibitions. Benedict, as the director of the Luxembourg uh, Museum, system systematically purchased the works of painters associated with these groups. Raczynski's interest uh, in the group of painters supported by Benedict went beyond their official position. On the basis of critical text and exposition, he saw in major Parisian galleries, he assumed that Société Nouvelle artwork was considered the final phase in the development of 19th century French painting. Straightening the position of contemporary art in the history of art was of great importance to Raczynski. He, also, he was also the president of the Society of Friends of Fine Arts in Krakow, an association supporting Polish art and artistic education of the society. He supported the idea of organizing an exhibition of reproduction of old masters paintings in Krakow with the following words. And you see, the exhibition will broaden views, kind of respect for sincere will and diligent work, explain many angles and know, unknown to the general public of today. It will connect the present and the past and bring them closer to each other. It will teach to respect and worship many things that today are met with mockery, devoid of an, of an understanding, and will deprive plenty of dross of the acclaim and admiration it does not deserve. It will be too easy to assume that by dross, Raczynski meant the post-impressionists 
It is important to note what role he assigned to old art. He believed that it was to connect the present and the past and bring them closer to each other. This phrase is crucial in understanding aristocratic attitude to contemporary art. Aristocrats were not interested in works representing revolutionary, in this moment, uh, tendencies, direction without history. When Raczynski came to Paris, he visited Salon Champ de Mars, an exhibition of uh, the Société Nationale de Beaux Arts, an association founded in 1990 in opposition to the traditional academic salon, offering the largest selection of contemporary works in the capital of France. However, when Raczynski spent time at the Champ de Mars salon, other collectors, French, German, Dutch, Russian, and later American, visited Parisian galleries, uh, such as Volach, Durand Jouel, Benham Jeune, specializing in selling works of the new art movements. These places were the starting points for creating collections of the new art. If we were to identify places on a map of Europe with the largest collections of impressionist and post-impressionist works, it would turn out that the old continent was quite densely covered with them. The works of innovative groups attracted the attention of, attention of individuals who created collection, collections, to, uh, to use Krzysztof Pomian's term, focused on the future, collection uh, tourne vers l'avenir. As indicated by researchers dealing with the subject, generally speaking, such collections were created by people who made change, innovation, progress, and the future day life goals. Another important fact worth considering is that the collections of works of new art movements were accumulated in three major cities, Paris, Moscow, and Berlin. Of course, there were other cities, but these three, because of their prominence and impact on others, are worth highlighting. Importantly, the number of aristocratic collections in the cities decreased at the end of the 19th century. Culturally, the dominating class was the bourgeoisie, interested in art, purchasing artwork, and sometimes even co-creating the policy of local museums, like in Berlin. According to Eva Rovers, some representatives of the wealthy bourgeoisie wanted to distinguish themselves from the aristocracy and de develop their own identity, closely related to the spirit of modernity and the zeitgeist at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, and thus the, to emphasize their autonomy. In Paris, the city of arist, uh, artistic breakthroughs, new art was initially purchased by people closely related to the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist circles. Fellow artists, the intelligentsia, Tom's people, painters, the second group who subsequently became interested in the new art were Parisian industrialists, merchants, and bankers. Moscow at the turn of the 19th and 20th century was a city of emerging, uh, emerging uh, commercial fortunes located far away from St. Petersburg where aristocratic families resided. It hosted uh, the collections uh, brought from Paris by Sergei Ivanovich Tukin and Ivan Abramovich Morozov, representatives of the new Russian middle class and supporters of native uh, Russian capitalism. We have already talking uh, talk it uh, a little bit about this uh, today uh, morning. Um, the third city, Berlin, was the capital of the young German empire with a thriving economy among German collectors interested in new tendencies. Two groups may be distinguished. Art experts uh, often associated with the artistic world and wealthy German industrialists and bankers often of Jewish origin. Researchers identify various reasons for the interest of German collectors in the art of impressionist and post-impressionist. Andrea Pophenk and Felix Billiter believe that the social advancement and fortunes of some collectors have been driven by technological and medical innovations. Veronika Grodzinski, who, who focuses on Jewish collectors, also emphasized uh, their openness to taking risks in business and the need to construct their own social identity 
society based on notions such as modernism and uh, liberalism, mm, I think. And I hope that further thoughts on this subject will uh, emerge uh, in the course of our conference. Of course, innovation, modernity, and progress were not the tenets of aristocracy. In those European cities where aristocrats maintained a strong position and were engaged in cultural activities, collections of works representing new tendency were very scarce, almost non-existent. And illustr an illustrative example of this tendency is London before 1905, uh, several purchasers brought to England single innovative canvases, both in France, treating them as novelties from the other side of the English Channel. Mm, uh, maybe the only on, uh, on uh, or one of the uh, few individual um, uh, collectors uh, unique for his collection of impressionist paintings was a wealthy industrialist, Samuel Gulto, for example. However, his collection was created uh, in the 1920s when impressionism, post-impressionism, and even the avant-garde gained the status of historical art movements. Collecting trends in the UK were for a long time determined by the uh, strong cultural position of the aristocracy. Uh, aristocracy. In fact, aristocrats were on the boards of the most important cultural institutions and major museums uh, in UK, um, uh, especially in National Gallery. The situation was similar in the territories of Poland, where aristocrats were members of all cultural institutions and societies established in the 19th century. The aforementioned Edward Alexander uh, Raczyński was the president of the Krakow Society of Friends of Fine Arts, which organized the main Krakow exhibitions in the second half of the 19th century. His predecessors in this post, Prince Władysław Sanguszko and Prince Marcel Czartoryski were also aristocrats. Uh, the relationship between the aristocracy and artists and their academic teachers were therefore very close before First World War. The local community shaped the position of Polish artists on the market, primarily the symbolist of the Young Poland movement, and determined their popularity. Support for Polish art resulted also from the patriotism of collectors, both from aristocracy and outside, while collecting Polish contemporary art was almost the dominant trend in the territories of Poland at the turn of the 19th and uh, 20th century, uh, before the First World War, before uh, independent Poland. Uh, to conclude, Aristocrats were interested in contemporary art, but only in the art that carried the notions they regarded as key ones at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, durability and continuity, an art drawing and stemming from artistic tradition. At the time, art considered as innovative, at the time, at the time, at first the art of the impressionist and post-impressionist and later of the avant-garde symbolized novelty, changes and progress. The new art attracted the interest of the new bourgeoisie, which grew in strength and wealth and began to dominate in some European city. Thank you very much. The rearrangement of noble collections has typically been analyzed with a solely museographic perspective, but it has been suggested that case studies could reveal a revised paradigm that would take into account social and ideological aspects of collection reorganization. And my contribution intends to provide such a case study with the intent of showing how social and ideological aspects were woven into the museographic narratives created in the Lyria Palace by the 17th Duke of Alba, Jacobo Fitzjames Stewart. I will attempt to show that the Duke's rearrangements build on the solid foundation laid in the 19th century by his mother Rosario, although the values that he inherits from her would manifest themselves differently in the first half of the 20th, in the first half of the 20th century with more emphasis on belonging to the grandee class, meaning the old nobility, and also with more gradual interventions that create the fiction of continuity to counteract the increasingly fragile state of the grandee's distinction. 
Its interventions also frequently refer back to some of the most decisive moments in the history of the collection, which we'll see more about now. So it's necessary to know two critical moments in the history of the collection of the Casa de Alba, as they're going to be referred to repeatedly. And the first moment refers to the testament of the 13th Duchess of Alba. She's the last of the Alvarez de Toledo family, and she died in 1802 without any children. And she left next to nothing from her immense art collection to her young nephew and successor, the seventh Duke of Berwick, Carlos Miguel Fitzjames. Many of the pieces that the 13th Duchess willed to other people were in fact bound to the family's entailed estate. And after the matter was pursued in court for many years, Carlos Miguel managed to inherit only 32 paintings in 1844. The concurrent termination of the legal framework of entailed estates in 1820 removed the restrictions that previously protected the integrity of collections. And from then on, the nobility was able to sell their belongings, however, and whenever they saw fit. The newly lifted restrictions and the poor economic state of the house then pressed the 15th Duke of Alba to put up much of the collection for auction in the Hotel Drouot in Paris in 1877. Many pieces were sold and this would be another decisive moment that later will be remembered by the family with much regret. In 1877, Rosario Falco, daughter of the Dukes of Fernando Núñez, married the 16th Duke of Alba, Carlos Maria. And her reputation was that of a sensible, dutiful young woman who revitalized the House of Alba, both culturally with numerous investigations in the archive and art collection, and also financially with advice from her family, at a time when the nobility's reputation was at a new low point. Of all of her projects, the archive was Rosario's most cherished, and from the beginning of her research, she always had in mind the idea of putting documents on the display in vitrines, which culminated in the arrangement of the vitrine gallery, where documents were placed on display with an accompanying exhibit of art, the contents of which were published in a catalog in 1898. This is the Salon de Vitrinas, the vitrine gallery, and these are the vitrines that were the documents that she put on display. However, the arrangement of the pictures in this room was not addressed in the 1898 catalog and has not been studied until now. At first glance, one can gather that the display adhered to a gentlemanly aesthetic that valued the visual harmony of varying sizes, color, and subject matter over an art historical narrative. The paintings on display were in large part traces of Carlos Miguel's extravagant collecting juxtaposed with other paintings that made visual references to the documents on display in the vitrines, which in turn reflected the family's role in Spanish history. The press lauded Rosario's design of the vitrine gallery for the way that it relived moments of glory of the House of Alba. Rosario is a really interesting figure and she actually renovated a lot of other spaces in the palace, which we don't have time to see here paying special attention to the Goyas and the house's tapestries, which were put up for sale in the 1877 auction, but ultimately returned to the palace. Her legacy was an important influence on her son Jacobo, both an example in the instilling of values centered on dynastic memory and preserving the integrity of the collection, and also practically in the foundation laid with her work of reordering the collection and the archive. A report in 1907 is the first mention of the antechamber, which is this image we see here in the bottom corner. And this must have been an addition by the 17th Duke. This room was filled with exotic hunting trophies and paintings of hunting scenes by Paul de Vos. These paintings were part of the original 32 paintings that Carlos Miguel Fitzjames Stewart, the 14th Duke of Alba, inherited from his aunt. Cayetana, the 13th Duchess. These paintings had belonged to Luis Mendes de Aro y Guzman, the Count Duke of Olivares, and were thus associated with the Carpio entailed estate. Therefore, the design of the antechamber really shows Jacobo's preoccupation with two recurring ideas, references to the old nobility and grandee titles, meaning the titles with origins in the 16th and 17th centuries, 
that would set the Duke apart from other newly named nobles, and also allusions to the decisive moments in the collection history, specifically the 13th Duchess's Testament and the end of Entailed Estates. Adjustments to the Vitrine Gallery before 1920 show that the 17th Duke furthered initiatives previously put into motion by Rosario, such as continuing the perfection of the separation of art schools. Rubens' way to the market here provided a more appropriate setting of school and period for the remaining pictures on this wall, as did the replacement of Rizdo's landscape. The placement of Solomon Koenig's Allegory of Peace, a reference to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, placed next to the armor of the Count Duke of Olivares, strengthened the idea of patriotic and monarchic service and relived moments of family glory. Furthermore, Ribbon's Way to the Market also recalled the tension between collection dispersion and recovery at the end of the 19th century. This painting was purchased in 1878, just one year after the draw sale. It was listed in the second Duchess of Berwick's inventory and thus constituted a sort of recovery, a rescue of dispersed patrimony. This painting here took the place of Sikis um, by Il Pordenone, which was a purchase by the 14th Duke Carlos Miguel. And Jacobo is responsible for one very significant addition in 1919, which is the inclusion of the image of himself into the discourse with a portrait by a contemporary artist. This is a painting by Ignacio Tuluaga that the Duke of Alba commissioned in 1918 to commemorate his engagement. And Tuluaga was an important artist for the Duke of Alba because he was already successful in, in France, but he had not been able to break into the Spanish market really until the commission of this portrait. The year 1920 was marked by the Duke's marriage, although a quiet affair, and the death of the Empress Eugenie while staying at Lyria Palace, which was not so quiet an affair. And it sparked a lot of interest in the press, which provide a few very useful report, reports that describe different rooms in Lyria Palace, especially where the Empress held audience and her bedroom. Eugenie's influence, both direct and indirect, on the collection over the years is significant and merits a whole other talk on, on another day. An inventory of the paintings on display in the palace in 1931 shows that the Duke made several more changes between 1920 and 1931. The distribution of paintings continued to follow the gentlemanly aesthetic, although with a reduced number of pictures. A decreased visual connection to the documents in the vitrines. And more emphasis on grandee lineage. The combat of the Amazons and Greeks, which is highlighted in blue, was listed in the inventory of the second Duchess of Berwick and made a pair with the way to the market on the same wall until it was replaced by this painting by Pedro Orente, Jacob giving drink to Rachel's herd. The Orente painting was one of the originals of the House of Alba. And again, one of the 32 paintings that Carlos Miguel inherited from his aunt, the 13th Duchess. The inclusion of a painting by Rivera, now attributed to Luca Giordano after Rivera, is particularly interesting because the Duke went to great lengths to acquire this work. And it's a, um, it's a unique purchase that he makes because it's one of the very few times that Jacobo purchases an old master painting that had no obvious relevance for the collection in terms of iconography or provenance. Although he did purchase it the same year that he was admitted into the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, which I'm sure is not a coincidence. Together with the addition of the crucifixion by El Greco, this wall exhibited a more unified aesthetic with dark austere backgrounds, solitary figures, and pronounced chiaroscuro. So to summarize, between 1907 and 1931, the most significant changes to the display in the palace were in the antechamber and in the vitrine gallery, with the desired effect of highlighting grandee standing, perfecting the separation of art schools to more closely follow academic art historical standards, and referencing decisive moments in the collection's history, and also reliving times of dynastic greatness. The Duke's emphasis on the restoration of the collection and the exaltation of his noble house was a very different approach to collection management than the bourgeoisie took, 
who tended to bequeath their collections to public institutions. During the reign of Alfonso XIII, there was an increase in concessions of noble titles, which meant that the social distinction that a title provided was in jeopardy with the rapid expansion of the noble class. The Diputación de la Grandeza, which is an official organization that united the group of grandees, took issue with the overflow of titles. Jacobo boasted an impressive 14 grandee titles and would later lead this organization as dean. In April of 1931, the Second Republic was proclaimed in Spain after elections, and in July, laws were passed limiting the use of noble titles and freezing the concessions of new titles. So in summary, in the first third of the 20th century, the distinction of the grandees was vulnerable on two fronts, the fragility and the subsequent exile of the monarchy, as well as the expansion of the noble class with the increase in the concessions of titles. So we can see then in this climate, how Jacobo's endorsement of the social legitimacy of the grandees in his collection is also inevitably mixed with political undertones. In his admittance speech, upon entering the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in 1924, Jacobo centered on the tradition of artistic patronage in the House of Alba and the essential role that the nobility played in society and the arts. In the response to Alba's speech, the Count of Romanones echoed the Duke's main premise. Whoever conceives society without religion, monarchy, and aristocracy, also without fine arts. So it becomes evident here again that the ideas associated with noble artistic patronage in the first third of the 20th century were inextricably intertwined with social and political ideologies. In 1928, Alvaro Alcalá Galeano, writer and literary critic, wrote an illuminating essay about the decline of palatial life and the noble class that went along with it, in which he also referred to the rising competition of wealthy businessmen. In the Madrid of today, the palaces are closing and the big hotels are opening. Money has moved to new hands, and today it is not the great lords who boast luxury, but the great magnates. The English dukes start out selling their paintings to the New York millionaire, and if they haven't been lucky enough, to marry one of his daughters to balance the rickety household accounts, they find themselves obligated to sell their own house to the new village. But while many palaces were in decline in selling off collections, even selling the property itself, Lyria Palace was considered a beacon for the, the old nobility's aspirations of endurance. The strategic display of endurance and a present day tangible link to a glorious past also explains that while Lyria's art collection was constantly a focal point, focal point in the press, the changes to its exhibit in the 20th century were relatively speaking rather minor. Save the antechamber, no space is entirely renovated as it was with Rosario. Even the changes in the vitrine gallery respect or gradually alter the gentlemanly decorative pattern of varying dimensions of subjects and paintings. One of the virtues that the nobility claimed to have that made them unique was a connection with history, with their deep knowledge of genealogy or their link with lineages of service to the monarchy. They seemed to incarnate the fiction of continuity with the past. Thus, the Duke's alterations are overall very subtle and add to this illusion of continuity. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the final changes that he made. The extensive groundwork, so in conclusion, the extensive groundwork laid in the 19th century by his mother Rosario provided the foundation for collection management upon which the 17th Duke of Alba would build in the next generation. Some of Jacobo's interventions would continue work initiated by his mother, like the separation of art schools and the restoration of dispersed patrimony, while others were unique to the context of the first third of the 20th century, such as the emphasis on grandee lineage and more gradual, more subtle interventions that fed the illusion of continuity to counteract the increasingly fragile state of this group's social distinction. It's also interesting to compare the Duke's preservation of the collection and his exaltation of his noble house, approaches that we have shown a representative conservative and monarchic political ideals, with the simultaneous generosity of the bourgeoisie's, bourgeoisie's donations and bequests to public institutions, 
a group typically associated with more liberal Republican sentiments. The social and ideological aspects of the music graphic rearrangements in the Arab Palace show that the image of integrity and preservation of the collection was somehow equated with the image of self-preservation of a dwindling social class and the conservative political ideas that would support it. Thank you for your attention. I have a question to uh, Camilla and Whitney, uh, the general one, uh, namely, how was not only uh, in the case of uh, of um, Whitney uh, uh, of this of this collection, but how was let's say in this aristocratic uh, uh, collections? What was with the let's say um, access of the uh, of the public? I mean, when it has started, and which way it was possible for let's say not the members of the families or of the aristocratic society but for the, uh, for the uh, public audience. It would be very interesting to, to know how it was in, in Spain, but also uh, because of Camila in, in uh, everywhere in Europe, if I can say so. Actually, the 14th Duke, Carlos Miguel, had a plan to open the palace as a public gallery, and it didn't happen because when he went on his grand tour throughout Europe, he actually brought the house to economic ruin because he spent so much money on art after he didn't inherit the artwork from his aunt from the, from the 13th Duchess, he went and purchased a lot and that's the grand crux of the collection today, but left the house with no money and so they couldn't open the museum that he had planned. But there was a plan already um, early in the 19th century to open the museum um, in the palace. That kind of stayed uh, on hold for some time and then at the time already of the 16th and the 17th Dukes, they would have private visitors and invite scholars. It, it, it was frequented. If there were students that wanted to come in, they could come in and, and see the collection. And I mean, it was known internationally to be, to be open to professionals and scholars. And, and today it's open to the public. Today it is open. I see, today I expect so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, it depends. I think it started from the 18th century. In the 19th century, collections were opening up rapidly. Uh, for some of them, we can talk about private museums with tickets, uh, guides, uh, staff, conservator. Uh, Raczynski, for example, in Rogalin himself uh, showed visitors around. Uh, the gallery was so open for everyone. I see, but but you know, for example, you are talking about Raczynski and of course about, let's say, this, this aristocracy, uh, public yeah. aristocracy in Prussia. But uh, in one way, if you think about, let's say, Lubomirsky Museum in Lemberg and Lwów, that you see completely different attitude, namely it was donated in one way yes. to the nation. So uh, I mean, this is because of the difference of, uh, of Galicia and of Prussia. No. No. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is, uh, that depends of, uh, of collectors, of collectors of the family, uh, because uh, um, example, Gołuchów, uh, Jawinscy and Charteris uh, in Greater Poland and also in Paris because the, there was a collection uh, started in Paris and transported uh, to, to Gołuchów. That depends on the family Czartoryski uh, because uh, uh, it was um, uh, Ordinacja um, uh, I, I I forget it what what is in English, but uh, this um, uh, this situation depends on the state of all family and uh, on the uh, uh, on the law. Uh, what it depends on the on the law in uh, in this moment in the Prussian law. Uh, so that depends on the situation of the family. Of the uh, of the collectors and uh, his ideas, uh, because Lubomirs uh, uh, had idea to donate 
collection to the public and to the people of Poland. Uh, and that's why this, uh, this museum, but not, this, this was not so easy, but, uh, but this museum was opened to the public in Lviv. Uh, the the situation is complicated and uh, and uh, depends on the uh, very uh, very different circumstances I think. And how was it because you were talking about the uh, 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 collections, the aristocratic collections, not only in Poland, but uh, you tried to compare it with another ones. How was, for example, in it? I, I mean, the difference between Prussia, France, uh, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, and then, of course, let's say Habsburgs, I mean, just the, the uh, 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 Austro Vengri. What's what, what the difference? As, uh, or they were different ideas different uh, attitude in these countries on you see I'm not so sure I'm not so sure I think that the situation is the same in all Europe uh, because of the um, some um, uh, cosmopolitanism of aristocracy yes the, the the members of this social group uh, was uh, uh, were, were uh, connected with uh, with some uh, uh, with some connection, reflection, lifestyle, and etc. So I think it uh, depends uh, on uh, uh, it depends on the uh, particular situation of the family uh, and of uh, of collector. Uh, I don't want to uh, to uh, to say that uh, it was. Uh, another situation in Prussia, in England, in France. I think we, we have some uh, collectors to, uh, who did uh, private museums, donate collection to the, uh, to the public museum, or uh, uh, had the collection in, at, the, at, the, at home and nobody is watching it. So that depends, I think. Do I see any? Any questions? Yes, I see one question. Uh, thank you very much, Milena. <laughs> this is not a question. But uh, I still um, uh, have a different question. Namely, this is a little bit connected also with that what, uh, uh, what Whitney was talking about. Namely, that a lot of um, aristocratic families um, uh, were impoverished in the end of 19th century and especially in the beginning of the 20th century. This is a very good example of, let's say, uh, Polish, uh, uh, the, the Eastern Poland, which after 1970 just uh, um, belonged to, to Soviet Union. And it means that a lot of families had to simply to sell their uh, uh, collections. And it was very interesting to discover how the objects uh, of the very old uh, uh, collectors, as in, in Spain, as you were talking about a little bit later on, they were sold on the sales or simply sold to especially to the new uh, uh, bourgeoisie, which was uh, partly interested in this, uh, in this uh, uh, art to play and to imitate a kind of, uh, 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 of, of life of uh, aristocracy. This is very well known um, in the process which one observes in, in, in Poland, this is very, very easy to, to discover it. all the people who had to escape from so-called Kresy, uh, 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 they, if they saved something, they had to sell it. I think that you've hit on a, on a key term there, which is the imitation, right, of the wealthy classes that are able to uh, have access to all of the symbolic value of these collections once they hit the art market. And it's really uh, a sphere that the nobility has a hard time competing in at this point because of mm, their economic state. In the speech in 1924, when Jacob was admitted into the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, there's a, a great quote that I have, I'm, I'm gonna read it. It's just one, one phrase. Um, it says that the, the, the aristocracy, protector of the fine arts, is not substituted in these times by the plutocracy because in them the artistic sentiment doesn't represent the satisfaction of the enjoyment of beauty rather is a man manifestation of mimicry for this reason what the multi-millionaire north american collectors do for art 
is not comparable to what our forebears of our colleague Mina Maduka Balba has done. So this is something that was on their minds, most certainly, uh, with the increase in, in movement in the art markets and the dispersion of the collections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's... Uh, um, this is also another matter the time because the position of the aristocracy at the beginning of the 20th century was different from that in the interwar period. Um, I think that the end of the 19th century is not yet the time of decline of uh, the aristocracy, of that social group, but the time when it's, uh, it, uh, when this social group is strongly confronted with other new forces of the rich bourgeoisie, uh, et cetera, um, the aristocrat, uh, aristocracy also on the level of art and culture has to strengthen its identity uh, to distinguish itself from other collectors. Interwar period is another time. Uh, here we have different situation. You are talking about Eastern Poland, but it was different in Galicia and Wielkopolska in the independent, uh, independent Poland. It was not yet bad. <laughs> that time was uh, interwar period in uh, Poland's history for aristocracy uh, war still, uh, still good period, still good time for living. I'm thinking uh, we have some uh, some bankers tree. We have some uh, uh, some problems in uh, uh, Vilanov, for for example, uh, and Branitz in Vilanov uh, in in this period. But other uh, other families, uh, I think, uh, was was in were in 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 so good situation in interwar period interwar period in Poland, because the, uh, the aristocracy in England uh, too, but maybe in the other countries of Europe, uh, I'm not so sure, but the situation was, um, uh, um, was different. But in Poland, uh, Galicia, uh, Wielkopolska in interwar period, uh, it's, uh, it's not that bad situation. Uh, Eastern uh, uh, Poland, uh, that territories uh, after uh, 1920 and uh, war, Polish Bolshevik war, that is something, uh, something else. That is, uh, that is, uh, that is something else. I think. Can I Lena? say one one thing? Just add, like uh, Camilla, I think. There was also, because you were presenting this, showing like there are two uh, contrary ways of collecting, like um, aristocrats were more concentrated on the past and um, bourgeoisie on the future. So I think that this, this fits to uh, like Western conditions, but I'm not really sure if it, this fits to, to Polish uh, conditions as we have um just different different social um, social structure so there's this bourgeoisie which is in poland is not exactly the same like a middle class in in germany or in france or in 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 great britain this class is much 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 bigger much much stronger yes. they also yes, culturally of course, that was generally speaking uh, mm -hmm. uh, you are talking about this uh, this by words mm -hmm. in discussion mm -hmm. uh, yes the, the, that is so uh, that is generally opinion yeah. yes yeah. Uh, yes if of course i was trying to um, uh, study um, attitude aristocracy to contemporary art mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and why this mm -hmm. attitude is was that mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, but of course the uh, the um, differences between uh, aristocracy and bourgeoisie in uh, countries in europe is uh, more complicated but in the field of the contemporary art and attitude of aristocracy to contemporary art i think we uh, we may do some uh, general opinion, and it's not so bad to uh, generally speaking in this uh, in this uh, exactly uh, in this exactly subject. Mm -hmm. 
I want to, I want to, uh, at first, before I, I ask the, uh, uh, Felix your question, Milena, I want to say one thing, namely, of course, on, on one side, uh, um, Camilla is right, saying, and that, that we see that, let's say, the representatives of bourgeoisie were much more open towards, let's say, the modern or uh, I don't want to say contemporary, but the, but the new trends of art. But on another hand, is an enormous uh, amount of uh, uh, examples when just bourgeoisie followed the idea of the way of our life of aristocracy. So they bought constantly, and not only in the States, but also in, 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 in Europe, mm, uh, uh, objects which belonged to, mm, to uh, aristocratic or the landlords and so on who were impoverished. And they played and they followed even, let's say, the same kind of life. Yeah. If we think about, let's say, big collections, and I suppose that we will uh, listen it, uh, about it partly uh, at uh, Micah's uh, um, lecture, that we will see that that one 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 uh, one has to be very uh, very careful talking about oh. let's say this uh, this uh, this attitude of bourgeoisie. What does it mean? The and attitude it of bourgeoisie. Involved, yes, that's right. Yes, this is very right. important. And you are right, uh, and you are uh, now speaking about the situation in London and the UK. Uh, the influence of aristocracy on the cultural situation in London was therefore very strong. And uh, uh, let us also note that um, British bankers and industrialists collecting arts such as Henry Tate, um, George Selting, uh, Rothschild, uh, were not interested in the new tendency. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, they supported and purchased uh, contemporary British paintings, mainly academic, but also works of pre-Raphaelites, pre not impressionist, not post-impressionist, not avant-garde, uh, uh, like, like aristocrats. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. This this, this idea just to, to follow the model it was very was very present and partly still present. But before I ask uh, uh, Milena's uh, uh, question to Felix, I want to read what uh, Thomas uh, Stammers wrote. There are uh, there are also important aristocratic collector, uh, collectors of modernism in France. Things of the Comte Doria, a major collector of Degas and Cézanne. In Britain, the governor galleries for artists like Burne Jones were very much on aristocratic preserve. Aristocrats often prided themselves on being fashionable and ahead of popular taste, especially in the fin de siècle. That's true. That if we yes. We, yes, but I, say, I said, uh, of course, as always, there are exception of the rule, and I can say, say Count Harry Kessler, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it is often a, a situation complicated, but uh, but I, I don't know. I, I am. Uh, this is my opinion. I am um, maybe uh, too strong opinion, but uh, situation is complicated and the landscape is complicated. But uh, we can we can do some general uh, opinion. Uh, I think, but we uh, the, that that was the collection. Yes, that was the fun. <laughs> yes, but the excuse me, but the problem is, for example, if you take into account, let's say, the uh, Krakow uh, aristocracy, or let's say from small Poland, then you see, for example, that they just ordered and they supported Marcheski, a lot of a lot of uh, yeah. artists mm -hmm. of fin de siècle, or let's say they were not in in the sense of modern as. Uh, uh, Jones or Cezanne, but this was more, let's say, connected with the uh, uh, with the situation and with the local uh, interest in art. I mean, also of the artists that simply we had we had no artists like that, like Cezanne or uh, or Bert Jones. But in this respect, it means that uh, one can find especially in Galicia, um, uh, representatives of landlords' families and of uh, aristocracy, if it has a sense for Polish, uh, uh, for, uh, Polish 
British nobility uh, who supported and who ordered uh, paintings by, uh, by contemporary artists, which of course were not, let's say, so modern as, as, as uh, French in this yes. time. Yes, yes, but course. now I want to uh, 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 ask in the name of um, um, uh, Milena, uh, she wanted to discover what was the um, status of uh, the collection after 1945. Did this Nazi period cast a shadow on collection? Was it labeled as Nazi collection? Yes, um, thank you for the question. I think that's a very interesting and important question. Mm, um, which is also part of my PhD. I'm not writing about the time between 33 and 45, but the time before and the time after, I think is even more important because this defines actually how um, the continuities of this art collection um, actually go through the whole 20th century. Because the, the thing is, um, to, to answer shortly to your question, um, no, it was not perceived as a Nazi collection. And I think there were several reasons for that. Um, for one reason, as I said, um, Max Brahm was uh, the founder of the collection in 1904. So this was quite some time before the Third Reich. And so he was still perceived even though he lived until 1935 and even though he um, he had a great influence also during the time of national socialism on the the further development of the collection he was still perceived as the, the founder um, who lived around 1900 uh, in the munich art world so he was perceived as a quite different person who had nothing to do with the, the policy of National Socialism, which was, I think, also possible because there's no um, political statements of him. He, is, he was really just uh, an art collector, I think, and he was not very interested in politics, but he was interested in, in his very conservative uh, views of art. So these came together, but still um, it was not the reason, uh, the politics that he had such an you. And the second reason why I think um, the collection was not perceived as a Nazi collection is what I said, um, in the time of National Socialism, the, the reference point was actually um, what was collected in Munich in the uh, House of German Art, which was built just to show which kind of art was this new art that Hitler postulated. And so in the Haus der Deutschen Kunst in Munich um, from 1937 to 44, only contemporary artists, so artists that actually um, deliberately um, gave their pieces to the exhibition um, were allowed to exhibit their pieces. And in Rosenheim, you had artists that were actually not alive anymore since, wow. since decades. So it was hard to claim after five that this was a Nazi collection because the collection was actually a collection of artworks from the 19th century. And that also corresponds with the fact that in these paintings, you didn't have any elements, any um, figuration of national socialism because it has had, didn't have anything to do with it. So it was quite easy after 1945 to just continue with the same communal collection. Mm -hmm. And actually the first exhibition um, in 1946 was with the communal collection again. Of course, there were um, a couple of pieces that came into the collection in the time of National Socialism that um, disappeared uh, around 44, 45. Um, these were pieces like, for example, a bronze statue of Hitler, which was, uh, of course, a piece of National Socialist art. Um, so these just uh, disappeared, I'd say. I cannot say where they went. It's um, during the time of the American occupation that they just were gone, not on the list anymore. Mm -hmm. But in general, most of the artworks that were in the communal collection just um, 
you could just reuse them after 45 again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and this collection is still exhibited today in Rosenheim, yes? Um, uh, during, during that time, you had um, uh, a fixed collection, like a permanent collection that mm -hmm. was in the building all the time, but today, mm -hmm. The building is too small to exhibit the same collection all the time and also do contemporary exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, I think the 1960s or something, they changed the concept mm -hmm. and they didn't exhibit anymore um, the, the, the collection permanently, but rather um, changed to uh, do contemporary exhibitions and from, now and then they have still some pieces of the communal art collection that they exhibit. Um, sometimes they um, refer to the history of the pieces, sometimes they don't, but uh, they still, still the whole collection belongs to the gallery. It's still in their basement, but um, it's not exhibited that much anymore. <laughs> of course, because the interest is completely different, of course. But this was, yes. this, in your, in your uh, paper, was very interesting just to show, let's say, on one side, this, uh, mm, uh, this somehow, let's say, conservative, uh, very conservative view of, uh, mm, uh, 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 of fashion and of interest, uh, aesthetical interest, but of course, the, uh, the very modern uh, idea to um, to show it to the to the uh, public and this was this was quite uh, uh, quite interesting and of course that let's say the Nazi like this uh, this kind of art is uh, is uh, is obvious but I suppose we we could find in 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 many many towns in 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 Europe um, somehow a similar attitude namely to the uh, the, the collections of uh, uh, new owners who were interested in art who of course let's say followed the traditional uh, one they were not uh, involved in 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 let's say kind of avant-garde or even modern movement but then they could show it and in very a, a lot in a lot in, in a many provincial museums, you can still find such uh, 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 such examples. And, uh, uh, and of course, because it was not, uh, uh, not in the Nazi period afterwards. So they simply went, uh, uh, how to say, just, uh, uh, just through this, this, this time without problems. And then of course, uh, uh, museums changed their, their interest simply and they disappeared in, in any in any way, let's say, somewhere in Lager. Yeah, but um, I also have to add that I didn't mean that the, the collection was uh, perceived um, as a, not as a Nazi collection because it was from the time before, because also during the time of National Socialism, there was uh, an immense growth actually of the collection and there were many, many pieces that um, the National Socialist um, administration in Rosenheim bought. But the, the thing is that, as we know today, that more than 95% of the artworks exhibited during the era of National Socialism, when you look at them, you cannot see that they are from the time of National Socialism, because it's mainly paintings of uh, genre scenes, it's mainly landscapes, it's flowers. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to determine if a painting is from 1929 or from yes, 1934, idea, of because it's the same style that is actually antiquated um, in 1929 and also in, in 1934. So these pieces that they acquired during the time of National Socialism just perfectly fitted into the other collection that was also antiquated already. So it didn't matter if there was a 1934 on, yes. the, uh, on the painting because it just looked the same like the paintings from the 1920s and 1910s, yeah. Yes, this is similar afterwards with so-called real socialism. So these are all the, all the, let's say, attitudes which are conservative in the, in the wrong or the negative sense of the word. 